Rebuilding the American economy is about more than just creating jobs. It's about finding stable ground on the global stage. That's coming up next on UCF Metro Center Outlook. This program is made possible by funding from the UCF Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies, where government leaders, business executives, and academic experts come together to discuss major issues facing the state of Florida. Hello everyone, welcome to UCF Metro Center Outlook. I'm Diane Trees, director of the UCF Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies. Google the economy and results will likely include the United States, China, India, and other foreign countries emerging as key economic influences. Are they a threat? That's one of the questions journalist William Holstein looks at in his book, The Next American Economy. One of the places he found answers is here in Central Florida. I'll be talking to Bill Holstein just ahead, but first, Alicia Callanan Mandigo gives us a look at Holstein's case study number three, Orlando Simulation Boom. I came to, uh, to Orlando in the 1993 time frame. Retired UCF professor Pete Panousis has been on all sides of developing Central Florida's high-tech presence. His involvement started when Spain tried to lure his company away from Central Florida with a $90 million incentive. Now, the easiest thing was just to give us $90 million. At that time, uh, it was very uncommon for, for the, any of the government, uh, governments to put that kind of money into a business. Spain wanted the manufacturing plant for these silicon wafers. So Panusa started talks with government, UCF, and USF to see if there was a way to keep the business in central Florida. And one of the things that came out of that was the idea of an interaction between the universities to support the industry and in particular to support our company, which at the time was, uh, was an AT&T company. And, uh, and a lot of that became legislatively uh, enforced. And uh, it, was, it was a feature that we could use to sell the idea of building in Orlando that would have been very difficult for them to do in Spain. They really didn't have the capability to provide that kind of research. Ultimately, the silicon wafer plant closed and moved operations to the Far East. But the seeds of the high-tech industry were planted. Our core high-tech industry is Very modeling secure. and simulation. It is under the radar for most people because most of it is associated with one customer, namely the Department of Defense. Uh, that's not bad that it's associated with the Department of Defense, it's just that it limits the visibility of what goes on in that industry. There's no question modeling and simulation research is cool stuff, but you may be wondering, what does it have to do with me? Well, you might be surprised at the ways modeling and simulation have found their way into everyday life. Modeling and simulation has helped spawn our gaming industry. Simulation is also used for experiential teaching, therapy, the list goes on and on. It's strong, but it's not the talent magnet that Silicon Valley is. I think that we have to have as a core part of our economic development activity, companies that are born here, grow up here, and born from our investment in education that allows them to generate the intellectual capital that results in a successful company. The Creative Village concept came from an innovation studio called Ideas. It's a way to try to brand our local talent. Ideas sprang up out of Disney and illustrates how creative thinkers in an evolving world can utilize resources from multiple industries to strengthen Orlando's position as a high-tech player. Ideas projects literally span the globe. One of them, for instance, is a next generation studio that's going to be in the Middle East. And of course, the, the client came saying, well, I want to build a movie studio. And we said, no, no, you don't. That's a horribly old fashioned model. You want to build a next generation media center. And here are all the things you think about. Movies, fine. That's over here. You know, television looks like this, but 3D looks like this. But modeling and simulation looks like this. But game design looks like this. I mean, that's the, that's the new mental model. The new mental model applies to everything, from manufacturing to technology to entertainment to how we invest in these things. Alicia Callanan Mandigo from Metro Center Outlook. 
Orlando can be proud of the innovations that have emerged from operations based here. But much of the manufacturing coming from those ideas actually takes place on foreign soil. Many people are questioning whether China, India, and other Asian countries are now a threat to the United States. Joining me now is author Bill Holstein, who spent some critical years covering the modernization of Asian economies. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you. Your book, what was your goal in writing it? What do you want people to take away from the reading? Well, I want people to understand that we are now engaged with three billion new entrepreneurs in the world. If you add up the populations of China and India and, and the other emerging powers, this has changed the world. This has changed the fabric of how we need to do things in our own country. It, it puts pressure on us to ha adopt a smarter kind of American capitalism where we continue driving up the technology food chain, as you, were, as you would, of the value-added chain. If we do that, and we, we can remain supreme in the world, I believe, I don't think that any of these nations are de destined to overwhelm us. The, the downside, however, is if we don't uh, adapt our, our economic model, if we don't adapt our thinking, then we will turn into a third world country where we supply agricultural commodities and, and minerals and reprocess, reprocessed metals to these countries, and they provide us with the higher value added goods. So we now have opened up, we have now have globalized, so it, we, the pressure is on us now to adapt our model. So are we seeing the end of the age of America? I don't think we have to. I mean, you, there's a lot been written about that. Uh, the so-called declinists uh, among us believe that it is inevitable that the United States declines. I don't think so. I mean, it is possible to uh, sell into these markets. It is possible for us to retain our the superiority of our living standards, our per capita income. I mean, I think it's clear that China will be a bigger economy than ours within our lifetimes, bigger. But that doesn't necessarily mean more sophisticated. With 1.3 billion people, they should be a larger economy than us with 300 million people. That, that, that doesn't uh, bother me. Uh, what would concern me is if they were able to leapfrog us technologically and, and be uh, more sophisticated as an economy. But if, if we are able to adapt our model, we will be able to be, uh, retain the technology advantage, retain our living standards, retain our way of life. Uh, we won't be under pressure from the Chinese to manage our budget in any particular way as we are today. So we, we need to be taking steps as a nation and the states and regions to, to, raise, to raise our game, to be smarter about how we practice capitalism. Let's talk a little bit more specifically about China. They are rapidly building their physical infrastructure. Right. It's no longer the cheap labor pool that it once was. Yeah. The government is demanding transfer of intellectual property now, and it's insisting that research being done in companies be done on Chinese soil. So how much of an economic threat to growth for the United States is China? Well, it's, it's a double-edged sword. This is a hard thing to understand. Is it a threat? Yes, it is a threat. Is it an opportunity? Yes, it's also an opportunity. If it's opportunity, if you can sell into that market while retaining control of your intellectual property, selling into that market. General Motors, for example, one of the reasons they're still alive today is because they made so much money in China that that helped sub support the turnaround effort in North America. So it's possible to make a great deal of money there if you're intelligent and if you are wise. It's also possible to get eaten, have, have your lunch be eaten by the Chinese if you stand in the way. Uh, I call this riding the dragon, not standing in front of the dragon. So if you stand in front of the dragon, what you do is you try to do uh, industries that are dependent on uh, low uh, labor costs, and the Chinese can undercut us on anything that involves uh, cost of labor. So that's why we need to keep driving to more value-added kinds of activities and not insist on trying to protect industries where the, ch the Chinese and others can, can simply outcompete us on the basis of cost of labor. Now, things are really changing in China because their currency is increasing, the cost of labor is increasing. I think that what we're going to see is uh, American CEOs, American companies are going to begin asking themselves, was it really wise to locate so much uh, sensitive activity on Chinese territory? Should we bring home certain kinds of high value added activities, uh, particularly sensitive technologies? And that's one of your case studies, right. actually. Right. You talk about the Atlanta area, right. the offshoring 
versus backshoring and some of the downfalls that are now being really recognized in those countries that left. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think this is really important. Uh, I mean, because American companies are sitting on $2 trillion in cash right now. If we could unlock this one, one chest, this one chest of money, we could transform our economy quickly. So in this case, I looked at how NCR, National Cash Register, uh, brought home some high-end uh, manufacturing of ATMs back from China to the Georgia area, to Atlanta area. So they did it partly because they recognized that for them to remain uh, highly innovative and to respond to the needs of their customers, that they needed to have certain functions located in close proximity. They needed uh, feedback loops between software engineers, hardware engineers, people selling directly to the customers, the customers, the customers themselves. All these different functions need to be co-located in an ecosystem so that ideas happen so that uh, rapid innovation is possible. Instead and of the ideas here and, and, and then trying to translate. Right. right. The fact that the manufacturing was being done by another company halfway around the world meant that the idea, the idea loops were, were, were fragmented, were not, or were not working as well as they should. Slows it down a lot. Slows too. it down. So, so one of the things we can do in this country that uh, I think that is unique is create these ecosystems of innovation where large companies can find uh, the right employees, the right suppliers, the right connections with universities, the right connections with governments, to create these environments, these platforms on which they can compete in the world. So that's, that's what we should be striving to do. We should be striving to create uh, highly attractive environments, not just give them tax breaks, but create uh, the ecosystems of innovation, ideas, that attract our own companies to invest in our own country and to bring home some, uh, some of their investments from offshore. India is also emerging as an economic force. It's a democracy, and their infrastructure is not nearly as developed as China. Is India becoming an economic threat, or will it be a threat for the United States? Well, they compete in a very different way. They're competing uh, in information technology, in, in software, in consulting, and many of those kinds of functions. They are not yet a full-fledged manufacturing platform in the way that China is. The net, the net effect uh, for an American is that we have a wall of competition coming at us uh, uh, from manufacturing and information technology and across the board. We have across the, the board wall of competition coming at us. Now that wall of competition, are you talking about Japan, China, the Four Tigers, right. the BRIC countries? Right. So they, they all want to be what we are. They all want to be uh, owning the high, the high ground in technology and finance and so uh, so we, c we can respond to this by, by climbing aboard this, by selling into it, and while we move, keep moving up the ladder. That's, that's, our, that's what our strategy should be. Specifically with Indians, they are competing with uh, low-cost labor uh, in, in terms of their business process outsourcing and their software design, in terms of their call centers. But, but we're seeing some limitations to what they can do. Uh, we're seeing that Americans don't want to talk to Indians in the call centers. That, uh, that there's some u uniquely cultural things about how software is designed and about how systems are designed. Uh, and that as their labor costs rise, that gap is, is, uh, is diminishing, is easing. So I don't think that any of these powers are determined to wipe us out. If we recognize that we have globalized, that we're in deep embrace with these other countries, and that that puts pressure on us to uh, uh, practice a more sophisticated kind of American capitalism in which our, in which our institutions find more overlaps of interest, in which we uh, innovate more robustly, in which we commercialize our ideas robustly. I mean, we invented the, la the laser, the transistor, biotech, the internet, uh, the Xerox copier. We, we created all these things. We have a unique capacity for disruptive innovation. If we can capture those jobs on our own soil and we can continue to innovate, I don't think that there's anybody who's destined to wipe us out. You say again and again in the book that one of the key unique facts that we have going for us here in America is our ability to develop intellectual property. But so much of that with the ideas then translates overseas into the manufacturing. You talk about our society going from a manufacturing-based economy to a service-based economy, and that's imperative that we bring the manufacturing back. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it, you know, many people in Asia look at our research capacity and say, you're a research fulcrum, you're a research funnel. You guys come up with so many great ideas. We, we'll, we don't need to do the R&D here. We'll just take your ideas and we'll create industries from your ideas 
and we'll make the money. We'll sell you the things that you create, you invent, we'll make it and sell it to you. That's what's happening right now. That's what we need to interrupt, that cycle. is what we need to interrupt by successfully commercializing our own technologies, by building our own factories here that employ Americans. I mean, this is such, such a simple concept, yet we have not, not, not done it for the last 15 years. So if we can do that then and, and start wrestling some of that manufacturing back home, it'll be very important because we've discovered that consumption-based service sector activity, construction, retailing, casinos, those sorts of things have depended on hot flows of money. And now that the hot flows of money, the money we borrowed from abroad, ha has eased, has slowed down, is almost not non-existent in certain sectors, now that, that we've, we've discovered that those kinds of economic activity are vulnerable to the, the vagaries of the global economy. What the Germans and Japanese and other people in the world understand is that if we, if, if we dominate high value added niches in manufacturing, the f filtration systems, the semiconductors, the, the very specialized devices that the world needs, then those jobs are defend defensible against uh, international competition. People need those products. We, we have uh, many niche companies in this country already, but we make things that Americans don't see. We make filters and, and uh, irrigation equipment and buses and fire trucks and many of those kinds of things that, uh, turbines that build dams and many of the kinds of things that Americans don't see. We, ha we have not given up our capacity to be a manufacturing country at all, but we need to redouble our efforts to expand that manufacturing and to make it world-class competitive. You talk about dual-use products and translational work. Can you explain what those concepts are and why they're so significant to the creating the new wealth that you're talking about? Well, dual use is a concept that comes from military things. If, if, a, if a particular gear or particular piece of machinery can be used in a tank, it also can be used in another product. Uh, so we, we need to uh, gear up how we uh, export these products. We need to uh, allow more spin-ons. We need to do more with our technology in our defense sector rather than just letting things come into the civilian sector by accident. We need to be more conscious, more, more knowledgeable about... Actually design some things with that in mind or put the R&D money to... I think that the Pentagon ought to be thinking about where their economic base is. And, and are, is it a secure base? Should they be contributing a little bit to commercialization of some of the things they need that they depend on rather than waking up one day and finding out that the sensor they need for a particular kind of missile is made only in Korea or only in China. They need to look at their whole, their whole supply chain and say, uh, wh where are the things really made? And so uh, I think that, that could have a huge impact on the American economy right there. So dual use refers to things that are uh, 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 can be sold in, in either military or civilian sector. It's sort of an antiquated concept. I think we should be thinking about uh, how can we, how can the military invest in things that we can sell in the world without compromising our security. So it's not, for example, NASA had WD-40, which is always my uh, thought because it's in my garage, right. but WD-40 was a byproduct right. for commercialization right. that came out of something that was developed for NASA. But you're saying we need to go further than that, that we should be targeting to actually look at applications at the same time, not just accidental discoveries, but really looking to bring that research for commercial products. Out Yes, I mean, Tang was also something that came out of NASA and Teflon, uh, I think also something that came from the program, space program. Well, so we don't want our military to take its eye off of its core function, which is to protect us uh, in, in a world that can be hostile. We wouldn't want NASA to take its eye off of its core function, which is to, to create a, a profile for us in space. But you could say to, to any of those agencies, Take 10% of your resources, 10% of your mental uh, space, your bandwidth, and think about what are the technologies you have in-house that could be spun out, spun off, and, and devote some energy to doing that because it's good for the broader American economy, it's, it's good for the base of suppliers who, who support you as, and what your core, core mission is. So, so we're not talking about black or white here, we're talking about a shift of maybe 10% in terms of their funding and their, their uh, mental bandwidth. You talked in the book, I think you used the word tilt. Right. So it, it was a nice way to say, turn it a little bit, but you're right. not telling them to put the majority of the funds somewhere else or leaving the core concepts for 
our military or NASA? No, I mean, uh, this is uh, a key f uh, concept in the book. That we just need slight tilts mm -hmm. in terms of where the federal government spends its money. $150 billion a year goes uh, to basic science. What if they tilted that and took 10% of that money and focused on how do we commercialize these ideas that exist in our laboratories? The American uh, weapons laboratories, Oak Ridge, Sandia, have world-class technologies in them. And maybe only one out of 100 is getting out right now because the government has not invested in the infrastructure, the ecosystem for these ideas to emerge. Incredible ideas exist in there, world-class ideas that we, American taxpayers, have spent hundreds of billions of dollars to, to develop, so wouldn't it be great if just 10% of those ideas were able to flow into the, uh, the uh, commercial economy? You talk about that it is imperative for small and medium-sized businesses to be able to export and develop the savvy necessary to do that. In one of your case studies, the North Carolina one, they've been very successful. It makes sense when 95% of our population in the, in in the, the world population, is right. outside of the United States. Right. Can you talk a little bit about why North Carolina has done that? What have they done so well? Well, they created, again, I use the word ecosystem to describe what they did. They have, the state's very regional, as most states are, and so each of the regions of the state have uh, economic development organizations. It's different. Right, very, it's very variegated. Yes. In the east you have the sea, in the west you have the mountains. So each of these regions, uh, if, a, if an entrepreneur, a small, medium-sized business person says, I have this widget that I make, or I have this high-tech device that I make, and they do have a surprisingly strong technology base, I have this, and I, I think there might be a market out there in the world somewhere, I, but I don't know. I've never been there, I don't know. So these, at the regional level, they'll refer this entrepreneur to the State Department of Commerce, where there are people who have built successful international businesses, who know how to export, who have resources to help these people go on the first trips, translate their material into the different languages. It's a lot involved. It's a lot involved. And then the state people have relationships with the U.S. Department of Commerce, so that these entrepreneurs are able to come in and tap this ecosystem of, of uh, help to go out into the world, to find, to make their first uh, uh, connections with distributors, translate their uh, goods, and excuse me, translate their promotional materials. Uh, and so that does, that's, that's very difficult to do by yourself. So it, it seems to me, and seems to many people, that that is a legitimate role for government. That is not the government interfering in the marketplace. That is the government creating an ecosystem that supports uh, the internationalization of small and medium-sized businesses. And the state's been very good at bridging the gap with the businesses there and then interfacing with the federal government. Right. One of the criticisms with exporting is that it's increasingly difficult to defend intellectual property. When a device is manufactured and sold, then it can be replicated overseas. They are not under, those governments are not under the same restrictions um, in the same playing field. H how, do you, how do you protect against that? Well, you have to be smart. And so um, any exporter over a course of time, uh, if you're sending products out into the world, you need to start building an infrastructure out there. You need to have someone who works for you on the ground looking at what the distributor is doing with those products. Uh, you need eventually to start testing your products internationally. Maybe at some point you start assembling. So that's, but that could be a 10 year process. So you, need, you, you can't just put things on, on the boat or on the airplane and send them off and not pay any attention to how they're being used. You need to have uh, a, a, an ongoing travel. You need to have feedback loops with your customers, so what they're saying about the, how the product is performing and how it's, it's being used. So it's, it's not as simple as just putting it on a boat and a forgetting about involved, it. A lot involved. You mentioned a little bit before about niches that the United States has in certain industries, but one of the criticisms that we look at with exporting is that the United States simply doesn't make products that the rest of the world wants. Is that true? Well, you know, I've heard, I hear that a lot. And it's true that, that we don't make handheld devices that the Americans uh, 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 love so much. Uh, we don't make clothes as much as we did. Uh, don't make sneakers as much as we once did. Where we're very strong, however, is on the industrial infrastructure. When it comes to building out the infrastructure of all these other countries in India and Brazil, we make the turbines, we make the generators, we make the, the screws that they need, the fasteners, the filters, the fire trucks they need, uh, the mining equipment. We have companies that are world class in, in the mining equipment that they sell. So that's where we really are very strong. We're unbeatable in many of these areas because 
we have such specialized niche manufacturers who do these they're things. They're just not common brand names. But they're not co brand yeah. names that Americans recognize. When you talked about the reasons why you wrote the book, one was to figure out ways and relate that to create new wealth. Another thing you said, it's imperative that we decrease our dependence on foreign oil. Now, we expanding drilling uh, for, for gas or for oil, we had the BP disaster a year ago. Uh, we have a nuclear meltdown in Japan right now. Both negative connotations on using those forms of energy. And the drilling was always controversial. We don't have a policy for solar energy or for wind energy, and that's been with no natural disaster. How do we go about decreasing our dependence on the, the oil? Well, we, I think we do a little bit of a lot of different things. We need to develop the new technologies of solar and wind and lithium ion batteries. We need to do some of that. We need to have a smart regulatory framework for more drilling. I think we need more drilling in this country. I think that's, that's a, a, a reality. I think we need nuclear power. I think that the Japanese made mistakes locating uh, their nuclear power plant where a, where, where a tsunami could hit, hit it. They put the, the pumps and the generators below the reactors so that when the, the wave hit, it flooded out the pumps. It was badly designed and badly located. Nuclear power, I live three miles away from a nuclear power plant. I think that it is part of our, of our energy mix. I think we have to open up the, the uh, rock, the drilling for the rocks in, uh, in Pennsylvania the sh the sh and the schleys and the mud. We need to explore every different uh, avenue uh, open to us. We need to have more conservation efforts. We need to make, make a fleet of vehicles to be, uh, consume less energy. So we need a sustained national strategy. There's no one thing that's going to be a silver bullet. One last question for you. Despite the significant obstacles in our path, you still seem remarkably optimistic throughout the book and in our interview about America's future. Why is that? To give up would be a disaster. And I feel that many Americans uh, at the elite level and also at the working man level have just given up. And the consequences of giving up are disastrous to our children and our grandchildren. What that, what that means, just giving up, uh, uh, accepting defeat, what that means is that all of our lives are going to be poorer for it, that our children won't have the same educations that they should have, they won't have the same life choices that they should have, they'll have to accept uh, smaller houses, they'll have to accept financial pressure for their, their entire lives. And, and, and That's not the American way. That's just not the American the way. I mean, we need to keep fighting to create a better uh, society for our children and our grandchildren. If uh, I feel like if the pe people who are talking about defeat uh, are defaulting and they're giving up, and I don't think that that's uh, the American thing to do. Bill, thank you for being on the show today. I enjoyed reading the book. It's a very understandable book and insightful. Thank you that's so much. Thank you. I've been talking to author Bill Holstein about his views on the international economy. America is waking up to the fact that many forms of wealth we've pursued for decades can no longer sustain a healthy economy into the future. Will the economic powerhouses such as Japan and China force us to consider new avenues of cooperation among universities, businesses, and our government here? Please give me your thoughts on our new Metro Center interactive website. I'm Diane Trees. Thank you for joining me today on UCF Metro Center Outlook. This program is made possible by funding from the UCF Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies, where government leaders, business executives, and academic experts come together to discuss major issues facing the state of Florida.